All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. Good morning to you. It is the Mark Thompson Show here on the Mark Thompson Show Network. Hi, Albert. Albert, along for the ride today. How's it going? Good morning. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you. I am so glad it's Friday. With Halloween, somehow it seemed like the longest week ever. Yeah, it's been a pretty long week. I'm just, uh, (laughs) I'm I'm also glad the weekend is here. So looking forward to just sleeping. You know, it's one, it's been one of those weeks. Any big sports contest you're watching this weekend? I know you're the commish. Um, the, the Niners are on a bye week, but, uh, not, not, not too much to watch. The world series is over. It's not like anybody's watching baseball and the sharks. I love hockey. Sharks are awful. They're oh. they allowed 10 goals last night and they're zero and 10. So it's not good. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for that. Uh, I don't know if you saw this story about this kind of raggedy ass house that was boarded up and looked like a total eyesore. We'll talk in a minute about how much it's sold for. We'll talk about uh, the Trump trial going on. We've got Michael Schur and Jim Avila coming up later on in the show. Of course, it's Friday Fabulous Florida. And Albert, I was taking a look at the stories that are coming up, and you have done a bang-up job today. And then, of course, we've got Michael Schneider coming up, too. Yeah, so it's a good Mike uh, Mark (laughs) Mike Thompson. (laughs) He's not here. It doesn't matter what we call him anymore. It's a good Mark Thompson show coming up. Of course, Mark Thompson is the hey, Which host one do you use, Mark show. Thompson? Who, what? Who's Mark Thompson? He is uh, headed back to D.C. for some uh, parental time. I love that he goes back there and hangs out with his parents as much as he can. So he'll be doing that today, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I believe, before he comes back. But it's okay. Albert and I got this, right? We're going to keep the show rolling. We're good. We're we're gonna be good without him, hopefully, and then yeah. Tony's gonna be mixing in uh, a couple <laughs> of those days as well. Fingers crossed. You never yeah. know with us. It's a crapshoot. No, we're gonna try our hardest. We're gonna try our hardest. Oh, uh, thanks everybody for being in the chat. Uh, I should tell you, uh, if you could please click the like button, we love that. Thank you so much for that. And if you haven't subscribed, you're here and you're like, what's this show about? Please click the subscribe button. That's free and it really helps us out. Um, themarkthompsonshow.com the website with the click throughs to the Patreon and the PayPal links there as well and the super stickers are open so yes you can see that at the bottom of the screen themarkthompsonshow.com and of course we rely on you couldn't do this without you guys so and thanks for being here and spending your morning with us as well let's talk about this old house this house you know last week I think it was last week we were talking about the um, the house with a meth lab in it in san jose There's never been anything sale, like this for sale for one and a half million dollars well this this house went viral it's a raggedy ass old home uh, a boarded up house went viral on instagram they had it on sale for i think 780 is what it was and it's a two it's only two bedrooms it's one bath right it's on North 16th Street. I think of what city it's in. Uh, North 16th Street. Well, I know it's in the Bay Area. I want to say it's it was, I don't it was think San it's Jose. San is it San Jose? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, like, it's boarded up. It's tiny. One bedroom, uh, rather, two bedrooms, one bath. And it's apparently when the real estate agent did this video that went viral, she took you inside, showed the video of this house that looks, I mean, awful inside just like a you know should be condemned she said there was a big spider in there that was taking up residence it has a really creepy creepy basement she said it's either luxury living or is ready for casper the ghost uh casper the ghost is more like it well it's sold this house sold yeah san jose dirty dingy looking rooms a spider so large it should be paying rent a creepy basement a garage with a missing board in its ceiling that she's she said oh look it's a skylight uh this house sold for seven hundred eighty thousand dollars what the hell is going on in the united states of america it had been listed for 715 it sold for 780 it was first listed september 12th and 
it's uh it's sold somebody's gonna fix her up and i guess flip it i i don't know you imagine i mean seven hundred eighty thousand dollars for that it's all location I can't imagine forking out that much money and not being able to walk in and live into a, in a place. But that's what we're we're doing here in the Bay Area. Seven hundred. I mean, it seems like it's a lower dollars. price. I feel like homes are just like millions of dollars nowadays. In San and, Jose, they San are. Jose. Yeah. Even a two bedroom, one bath. It's like it's so small. Although it does have a basement, so you know. There's a there's, there's a virality to this. Like it went viral, <laughs> so maybe they just got it just because everyone was talking about it. I guess. I don't know. It doesn't look like much, you know? So that's uh, that's what we're doing in the Bay Area, paying $780,000 for that. I don't know if you saw this story in Politico this morning, but I did. It's exclusive to Politico. And it's about an anti-Trump group that produced four attack ads uh, attacking the Trump legal troubles. So these ads go uh, go on. They They... One, they say, uh, one ad says the Trump indictments war, uh, this guy comes on, he says the Trump indi indictments wore me down, uh, undercut Trump's ability to win the election. Another one says the trials presented too much baggage and warned Democrats would sensationalize on that to hurt Trump. Uh, the hardest hitting one of these commercials apparently says Trump would be convicted leading President Joe Biden to cruise on to re-election. So you would think that with those kind of messages would be the kind of messages that, you know, an anti-Trump ad should be hitting on, right? Hard on all of his legal troubles, on all the things he's alleged to have done wrong. The problem is, according to Politico, the ads totally backfired. Instead of doing what they were intended to do, which is casting doubt on Trump and his ability to lead or even be out of jail... Three of the four actually boosted Trump's support among the participants. One, the soft one, had no measurable impact on his Trump's numbers. The other ones that were a little bit of a uh, harder hitting, they had the people, I guess, feeling bad, feeling sympathy and lining up against Trump. So I don't know what you do. I don't know what you do. Uh, what they're saying in Politico is that these behind the scenes deliberations around these ads really highlight how Trump's legal problems, if they've done anything, have actually helped him, not hurt him, in his standing in the primary. So we have our first nominating contest less than three months away, and it doesn't look like, at least to the people they talk to, that the legal ramifications of what happened with Trump are going to have any impact on his success here. I don't know. I mean, we'll talk to Jim Avila and Michael Shore about it in a few minutes, but man, I'll tell you, it's a, it still continues to surprise me. Uh, yesterday, also, the Trump children continued with the taking of the stand in the New York civil fraud case. And... <laughs> Donald Trump Jr. was on the stand. It's like they don't take it seriously either. You know, they're just so nonchalant about everything. Like, no problem. At one point, apparently Donald Trump Jr. had a request for the courtroom sketch artists. He said to her, make me look sexy. <laughs> really? You're here on fraud charges. Most of your money can what? be taken from you. And you're worried about how the courtroom artist makes you look, making you look sexy? Mm. Okay. Yeah, he spent hours on the witness stand trying to distance himself from the financial statements that the judge already ruled fraudulent, but he's saying, hey, it's the accountants. It's not, it's not me. I didn't do anything, right? And then we have Eric Trump, who also took the stand. And, and I know no matter what Mary Trump says, She's always, you know, you kind of have to take her with a grain of salt because she's always going to be so one-sided. Does not like this part of the Trump family at all. She came out and told Newsweek magazine, Eric Trump just lost the entire case. That's what she said. And it's true that he kind of got a little flustered on the stand. He also said he had nothing to do with the statements of financial condition produced by the Trump organization. And then he was asked again, 
did you know about your father's annual financial statement? And because of all the signatures and everything else, he said, it appears that way. Yes. Because he kind of got flippant with that answer, Mary Trump is saying, unbelievable. Eric testified today, basically just lost the entire case. After testifying that he'd never heard about the Trump org statement of financial condition until recently, he later admitted that he knew about it back in 2013. After saying he never worked on it, uh, he was apparently uh, shown the document and there was discrepancy there as well. So she's saying Eric Trump lost the entire case. And he was mad afterward. Do we have that video, Albert, of Eric Trump on the courthouse steps? You run some of the most significant buildings, some of the best golf courses, so many other great properties. And the witch hunt that this woman is under, the witch hunt that this person is under, to get my father for political purposes, is disgusting. They've dragged Don and I and Ivanka into it as collateral damage. They only want our names in this thing because it sensationalizes the case. We've done absolutely nothing wrong. We have a better company than they could have ever imagined. And this is a big charade that's a huge waste of taxpayer right. money. Blah, and it's blah, the very blah. reason everybody's moving out of New York State. And I was actually one of them. It's sad. It shouldn't happen. I love this state. This state is absolutely going to hell. Yeah, and it's because absolutely of people going to hell. like the Attorney General of New York. So Eric Trump says the state of New York is going to hell, and it's because he, his brother, his dad, and the Trump organization are on trial. And the whole blah, 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 witch hunt, witch hunt, come on, just taking a page from your dad. Now, Trump is under a limited gag order. He's not supposed to say stuff like that, but I don't know if his son is. So is that, you know, now we get to trot the sons out so they can say all the stuff that you wish you could say? Okay, it just seems such, you know, bitter beans. I guess he's angry that his money could be taken away. His inheritance is affected. All right. So he's not the only one. So we had Donald Trump Jr., who's saying, make me look sexy. We've got Eric, who thinks the state of uh, New York is going straight to hell. And then we have Ivanka. Now, she was not... A, uh, part of this civil suit because of the statute of limitations. So she, they tried to have her as part of the defendants, uh, but she got out of that. They still want her to come testify, though, because of all the things that she knows. But she played the mom card. She said, listen, you know, weekdays are really bad for me. I have kids and it's the middle of the school week. And um, hey, it's just really I'd like to not come testify. Listen, I'm a mom. I've got two kids. I know the school week is not the ideal time. The weekend isn't the ideal time. You know, we have music lessons. We have band. We have birthdays. We have playdates at the park on the weekends. All these things are happening. But don't tell me that Ivanka Trump doesn't have a stable of nannies, doesn't have a gazillion dollars to pay for child care, and doesn't have the means or wherewithal to have her kids taken care of. She probably has more resources than I do. Wild. I'm a sympathetic person. Listen, on this show, the other day, Mark Thompson uh, said, you know what? If you need to go early to put on the classroom Halloween party, go do it. And so I did. Same with John Daly. He's like, let's record our show early so you can go do this mom thing that you want to do. There are times when... You know, it's it's hard to balance being a mom with everything else. This is not that. This is, I don't want to testify in a trial against my brothers and my dad, and I'll do anything I can to get out of it. So I don't think, you know, I the judge saw through it, denied. She's not getting out of it. She's, she needs to come there and testify in person, midweek or not, whether you have kids or not, you got to go do it. Now that's what's going on with Ivanka. She said it's a hardship. <laughs> Midweek, just not good for me. Right. Okay. Uh, so that's what's going on. And we'll talk about the trial, about what's happening. Oh, and another uh, related to the Trump legal scandal the in the Washington, D.C. Uh, election case, Judge Tanya Chutkin also Im uh, imposed a limited gag order on Trump. He asked her to lift it. She said no. He wants to appeal it to the Supreme Court, which will be interesting. 
And so he's asking for uh, the gag limited gag order to be lifted for seven days while he has a chance to appeal it. And it looks like that's a no go as well. So uh, I don't know if, if the Supreme Court will get involved in that one, but it will be interesting to see what happens. So we'll ask Michael Shore and Jim Avila about that and see what they have to say. Um, another story I've been following is, and this one is kind of speaking of being a mom, kind of something I'm paying close attention to. And you know, they say that after COVID, there was kind of a, I don't know, it's a brain drain, but kids haven't been doing as well in school. Well, the state of Oregon just dropped all graduation standards. Apparently, they say, failing all of its students in the name of equity. I don't know if you can say that. Although, I don't want my kids to have lower standards to graduate. But if you have a bunch of kids that aren't doing well, and you can kind of track it back to the pandemic, and the school system didn't have time to, you know, raise them up so that they could meet the standards. What do you do? Do you have like a whole couple classes of kids with no high school diploma? I don't know if that's fair. But the Oregon Department of Education, according to The Hill, decided that basic reading, writing, and math skills are not required for kids to graduate with a high school diploma. This was a bill that passed uh, in the Oregon Legislative Assembly's session, the assessment of essential skills requirement for high school graduation, they say it was sensible, read and comprehend a variety of text, write clearly and accurately, apply mathematics in a variety of settings. Students were required to demonstrate these skills by earning a, a at or above a cut score on the Oregon statewide summative assessment test. But citing the effects of COVID and school closures, they had to review the requirements for high school diploma options to address learning loss through the pandemic. And so they have suspended the Oregon Essential Skills Proficiency requirement through this school year, 2023-2024. And now... They're voting unanimously, the Oregon State Board of Education, to adopt an additional extension of that suspension through the 2027-2028 school years. So that means we're going to have multiple classes of kids that don't have to meet standards to read, to write, and to be able to calculate things at a certain level. And we're not talking about an advanced level. We're talking about kind of a rudimentary level, right? I don't like it at all. And while I understand the need to get kids graduated through the system and, you know, they need to go out into the world and make money and it's not their fault the pandemic happened. Well, whose fault is it that we couldn't teach them, that we couldn't do something for these kids to at least give them the skills they'll need to go out into the world and be somewhat successful? What does that say about the Oregon school system? Yeah, so, I mean, I've, if I was a student, I'd be kind of excited about it. But <laughs> looking when the, when they the announced low. that it was just going to yeah. be one year, I I was thinking about that class after them, right? But they they they're trying to extend it. It's weird because it's not their fault, like you said. And mm -hmm. but what what can you do about it? How can you catch people up or ca catch the kids up? It's it's a it's a hard task. We'll see what happens with Oregon. Should they pay the price for that? You know, should there be like, what, five years of kids who either don't graduate or graduate, but really can't do much, you know, that, and can you go to college when you don't have the skills to read and write? I don't know. Yeah. And how can you help yourself too to try mm -hmm. to get to increase your chances of higher education or different education? When you're not suited as well from your high school. So it's it's a yeah. kind of help yourself at this point, which sounds extremely American. Like, hey, if you want to make it to this college, the school is actually not going to actually help you. You got to deal with it you yourself. You got to do it yourself. Pull, your, you pull yourself up by your own little bootstraps and make it happen. Yeah. So that's happening in Oregon. I, I haven't seen anything. They're pulling like, an Albert, like, by the way, Kim. They're lowering oh, the bar. They're setting so. the bar low. Setting, hey, yeah. that way, when they vault over the bar, it looks like what a success story. Wow. This they're is geniuses. Amazing. Look at all these smart kids coming out of Oregon. They, they know all the standards that they're supposed to. Um, 
of course, Middle East, the conflict still waging, uh, raging. The uh, latest is that Antony Blinken uh, was calling for a ceasefire. There have been multiple lawmakers calling for ceasefire leaders around the world. And the latest development is that Benjamin Netanyahu says there will be no ceasefire in Gaza until all of the hostages are freed. So he's not willing to acquiesce at all until all the hostages are freed. And I don't know how that ends up for the hostages. If, you know, if the spotlight is put on them, if then Hamas doubles down and they don't the hostages don't survive. I don't know how that is. And I, it's awful to think about, but that, that is the latest. So uh, Secretary of State Blinken did meet with Netanyahu. He said more has to be done to protect the people in Gaza and the civilians. Um, he said it is shocking that the Hamas attack in Israel receded so quickly in people's minds and that now the focus was not on what happened in Israel, but what's going on currently in Hamas. But I, isn't that always the way? Like you're focusing on what's happening now, not what happened then. And I, people have all different kinds of ways of rationalizing the violence there. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, but I think this puts a, a very harsh spotlight on the hostages. And I hope that that stance doesn't end up with, you know, it being even worse for them than it already is. Did you hear that Jeff Bezos is moving away from Seattle? He's checking out. He is going back to his hometown, which is Miami, Florida. Sayonara, sucker! <laughs> which is appropriate to talk about on this uh, Friday, Florida Fabulous Friday. Uh, but he says, yeah, he's relocating from Seattle. He's lived there since 1994. You know, created most of his success there, but he's moving to Miami because his parents recently moved back to Florida and he wants to be closer to them. So I think that's lovely if you want to spend, you know, the parents are getting older, spend their, you know, golden years with them. He said, as exciting as the move is, it's an emotional decision for me. Seattle will always have a piece of my heart, uh, but he's going, he's going back home. I He's, mean, the, it's no question, like, from this time to the, probably till spring, you'd rather be in Miami than dealing with all the rain and all the few days of snow and up in Seattle. So it makes, it makes a lot of sense. And Lauren Sanchez will look great, in him and Lauren will look great <laughs> in South Beach. It's true. And they can have, she can have the, wear the bikini on the, the, the front of the boat. On you the know, yacht, we'll, yeah. We'll get a lot of pictures like that. So it'll be good stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, a story popping up on CNN this morning. Speaking of the whole Trump legal saga, there is a former Trump State Department appointee that has now been sentenced to 70 months in prison after assaulting police officers at the U.S. Capitol. I always think that people don't get enough of a prison sentence, but 70 months Okay, that's pretty good. His name is Frederico Klein. He's a former State Department appointee. He was found guilty following a bench trial before a judge this summer on multiple counts, including assaulting multiple police officers on January 6th. The judge saying, your actions on January 6th were shocking and egregious. Uh, the judge, also a Trump appointee, is telling this to another Trump appointee. Uh, Klein uh, assaulted an officer during an initial breach on the Capitol grounds, telling the officer, you can't stop us. The judge also detailed several other assaults on officers from Klein, many of which occurred uh, in the Lower West ter uh, Terrace Tunnel, one of the most violent areas that day. Um, one of the former U.S. Capitol Police was on the stand in this trial and said that Klein attacked him multiple times with a police riot shield. And he said how someone who took the same oath I did to protect the Constitution could be involved in such an assault on the Capitol, I don't know. Klein was a former Marine. He had access to sensitive information, a security clearance at the State Department, uh, and suggested that in attacking the Capitol to keep Trump as president, that he also could have trying, been trying to keep his job as an appointee. 70 months in prison he gets for this. So, okay. I mean, he attacked people and hurt people. Probably could have been a little bit longer, but we'll take what we can get, I think. I'm 
so interested. We were talking earlier this morning about whether whether or not Trump will be going to jail in these uh, cases, and whether or not if he uh, falters on the gag order, right? He's already been fined twice for ignoring the gag orders. Whether or not he could actually spend time in a even a holding cell. Or if he is sentenced or found guilty, does he go to jail and where and how long and, 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 you know, how long is appropriate? And if some of these sentences have been so light for this, but with all the people that are flipping on him being given a slap on the wrist, does that mean his sentence is going to be longer? So interesting. Again, Michael Shore, Jim Avila uh, is headed our way. So we'll talk with them about all of this, but it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, the Supreme Court is going to be considering a challenge to the federal bump stock ban. That, uh, that's the piece uh, on a semi-automatic rifle that will allow you to more rapidly discharge uh, bullets, hundreds of bullets a minute. Uh, federal appeals courts have been kind of split on whether this ban on bump stocks is legal. It seems like full on common sense to me. What what possible need could we have to fire hundreds of bullets per minute? None. Absolutely none. So the Supreme Court is apparently going to consider this challenge. I worry about what this particular Supreme Court will have to say. We just had this mass shooting in Maine. It seems like every time you turn around, more people are affected by gun violence. The bump stocks were originally banned when Trump was president. Uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives banned the bump stock devices in 2019, ordering people who possess them to destroy them or turn them into the ATF office. Trump ordered a review of the devices after the shooting in Las Vegas. Remember that one on the strip? which a shooter armed with a semi-automatic weapon and a bump stock device opened fire from his hotel suite. 58 people died in that shooting, hundreds of other people wounded there. And so the case that the Supreme Court will hear is whether the ATF exceeded its authority by reclassifying bump stocks as machine guns under the National Firearms Act. A machine gun is interpreted as any weapon which shoots, is designed to shoot, or can be readily stored or restored to shoot automatically more than one shot without manual reloading by a single function of the trigger. So it, it seems like the bump stock would qualify under that description. Did the ATF overstep? And the Supreme Court will be, uh, will be talking about that and making that decision. All right, let's do a little news, Albert, before we get to... Friday, fabulous Florida on this Friday on the Mark Thompson show. What do you think? Let's do it. All right. The Mark Thompson show. There it is. On the Mark Thompson show, I'm Kim McAllister. And this report is sponsored by 10 new to vineyards in Livermore with the why are you yelling red and the hey, which one of you is Mark Thompson Pinot Grigio? Israel is dismissing calls for a temporary ceasefire in its war with Hamas. Following a meeting with Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Tel Aviv, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he will not consider a humanitarian pause in the fighting in Gaza unless Hamas returns all of its hostages. And as we mentioned, Eric Trump testifying again today at his father's civil fraud trial in New York, the son of the former president, who's been answering questions regarding the financial documents of the Trump Organization. Former President Trump expected to take the witness stand when the trial resumes in Manhattan on Monday. New data reveals the economy may be slowing. Figures from the Labor Department today show the unemployment rate rose a tenth of a percent in October to 3.9 percent. Uh, analysts had expected that rate to hold steady at 3.8 percent, so not exactly what they were hoping for. A Ford Motor Company says its October sales declined by more than 5 percent because of the United Auto Workers strike. The automaker sold about 150,000 vehicles for the month, with electric vehicle sales up more than 9%. Ford began calling workers back to their jobs Monday after reaching a tentative deal with the UAW. 
Marvel is releasing the first trailer for its upcoming series, Echo. I haven't heard of this one. The series will star Alakwa Cox as Maya Lopez, also known as Echo, who is a deaf hero that communicates with American Sign Language. It will be the first Marvel Studios series to be rated TVMA and is expected to feature more violence than anything Marvel has done so far. Echo debuting on Disney Plus and Hulu on January 10th. Two robo-taxis, Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass putting the brakes on those robo-taxis. She'd like regulators to take a harder look at this new technology to make sure that it is safe enough to operate in the city. Driverless taxis from Waymo are already picking up fares in Santa Monica on a trial basis. There have been no reports of problems, but in San Francisco, where Waymo competes with crews for passengers, a robo-taxi dragged a person down a street after uh, the person was hit by a car with a driver thrown in front of a, a robo taxi and then the robo taxi apparently dragged the person down the street some serious injuries there the dmv promptly suspended operating permits for crews after that the general motors back company has since suspended its u.s operations so uh yeah and now los angeles is saying wait a minute hold up we don't know People protested this morning at the Port of Oakland, some reportedly locking themselves on a ship they believe is bound for Israel with weapons. It's happening at Berth 20, where the Cape Orlando, which is a U.S. military supply vessel, is trying to depart for Tacoma, Washington. Protesters have said a confidential source is telling them the ship will be loaded with weapons and military equipment before sailing to Israel. The group of about 200 community members are protesting the loss of innocent, li innocent lives in God and calling for an immediate ceasefire again that underway at the Port of Oakland. A man who was convicted of second-degree murder in California's first fentanyl-related homicide case is sent being sentenced to prison this morning in Riverside County Superior Court. Vicente Romero was sentenced to 15 years in state prison. In this landmark case, Romero admitted to giving 26-year-old Kelsey King a pill in 2020 he knew was laced with fentanyl, and King later overdosed and died. Again, a 15-year-long prison sentence in that case. There is a new foundation now recognizing Matthew Perry's hope to be known after death as someone who helped others, not just as an actor from Friends. The Matthew Perry Foundation, newly formed, is accepting donations to help those struggling with addiction. Its statement says it's guided by his own words and experiences and driven by his passion for making a difference in as many lives as possible. Perry, of course, very open about his issues with drug and alcohol abuse. He became addicted to Vicodin after a jet ski accident, later turned his former Malibu home into a sober living facility called the Perry House. So, um, I don't know if you guys heard this story. I mentioned it yesterday, I think, on Nikki's show. But if you haven't heard it, it's wild. You know, this whole Jimmy Hoffa, where is he buried thing it still has legs, so we can add this to the list of places Hoffa might be buried. A team of cold case experts is now out with a report saying the former Teamsters boss is buried in the parking lot of the Milwaukee Brewers ballpark. The Case Breakers group says Hoffa's body is buried where third base used to be at County Stadium, currently under the parking lot at American Family Field. They think his body was dug up and moved to the parking lot when the new stadium was built in 1996. He has been missing since 1975. There have been dozens of theories about what happened to his body. The question is, is do they have enough evidence to dig up the parking lot at, uh, at Brewer's Ballpark or no? We'll see. I don't think so. This report is sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore. And just for being a Mark Thompson Show listener, you get the exclusive deal. It's 10% off, 925-699-4576. You've got to call Rich out at Tenuta Vineyards and say, smash it with your iron rod. And if you say that, you get your 10% off. And I'm telling you, the Mark Thompson, why are you yelling red if you're a red wine drinker? So good. So good. If you go out to the wine rate, they've got 28 varietals, 14 white, 14 red. They're super friendly and kind. They have all kinds of events as well. So uh, check out the tenutavineyards.com website and take a look at what's going on out there and take advantage of that 10% off. I'm Kim McAllister. This is The Mark Thompson Show. 
Mark Thompson Show. This is Mark Thompson. Everything is going extremely well. What he's got going here is a situation. Friday on the Mark Thompson Show. Mark has the day off, headed back east to see the parents. Uh, But that doesn't mean that we're not celebrating Friday Fabulous Florida. Oh, no, because Albert has taken it to a new level. It is so good. So with Albert, I also welcome former Fabulous producer. Not that he's not still fabulous, because he's always fabulous. It's John Daly, everybody. Hi, John Daly. Hello, Tim McAllister. Did you say the Jimmy Hoffa story still has legs? (laughs) What? Joe Box can take I care of that. It. Yes, yes, I said it. Uh, it's interesting. I don't know if they're going to dig them up or try to dig them up. If, if you know, dig whatever's there up. If anything Ooh, is there at all, it's a wild idea, but it just might work. Mark has a strike force that he can employ, so maybe they'll get on it. I think so. I think we send Joe Box out there to take a look. Yeah. 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 Some of all his right, associates. Let's just jump right into it because what we have here is Friday. I'm so excited for Friday Fabulous Florida. It's time for Friday Fabulous Florida. There is a gigantic alligator in my kitchen. A look at the weirdest stories from our weirdest state. Story earlier in the week, John, and I didn't use it because I knew Albert was going to hone in on it. I knew it was going to be in Friday Fabulous Florida, and it's worth the wait. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. This Florida man was pulled over in a truck that looked a lot like a Border Patrol truck. Oh, yeah. Painted the same way, thought everything, except for instead of Border Patrol, it said Booty Patrol. Yeah, baby. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what more you want than the Booty job, Patrol you know. truck. Yeah, the Booty There's Patrol. There's never been anything like this was sadly interrupted by the so-called law enforcement in Florida this last weekend. (laughs) The DeSoto County Sheriff's Office said it was reaching out to raise awareness regarding a vehicle they tried to posit as impersonating a law enforcement uh, vehicle. The department was arguing that the vehicle in question, a truck with a booty patrol distinction, was impersonating the similarly named, but uh, yeah, Border Patrol. That's what they're trying to be there. They have the the uh, same paint scheme. Yeah, same. It looks like if you weren't really paying attention to exactly the wording, you would think it they were Border Patrol. They say they found the vehicle and the driver, at which point a traffic stop was initiated. Ultimately, the deputies issued the un- unidentified driver a citation over prohibited lights. You can't have police lights on your vehicle. My bad. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they say they put the, I don't think they put the post out to raise awareness. They put the post out because it's amusing. But they say they wanted to raise awareness about this incident, ensuring the public can avoid being duped by such individuals. We extend our sincere gratitude to everyone who called in with information about this suspicious vehicle. Your continued support is crucial in helping us maintain a what safe, are they, secure community. What are they community. concerned that people are being duped into? Having their booty inspected? I well maybe if these people are trying to pull people over or you know you think it's the border patrol but really it's I don't know everyone's I probably just thanking know. them for their service <laughs> thank you for your service to the booty yeah booty 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 people were saying no one is being duped 
that you're the reason why some folks feel the way they do about cops. You're not helping. A great way of using county funds, someone's saying. Um, also, I might do my truck like that. So people are kind of making fun of, of this whole thing. But yeah, booty patrol truck. And he's got going here is a situation. You can't do that. Yeah, Grady's got his own booty patrol. Their uh, next story uh, is a Florida man, of course, who took the company car for a spin after a couple fireball shots, apparently. That's what, what happened there. Marion County, Florida. This man arrested after taking the company car. He was charged with DUI after the incident in Summerfield, about 11 miles northwest of the Villages. Oh. Our favorite place, yes, this week on the Villages. Previ- previously. 61-year-old man reported to be driving under the influence of alcohol by an I'd be willing to s- bet my lunch <laughs> that there's alcohol involved. Oh, yeah, you'd be right. He works for an excavating company, took off in a company vehicle, allegedly. Uh, deputy pulled him over, said his eyes appeared to be watery. There was a, a smell of alcohol coming from the man. He said the employee was uh, the other employee was also at the scene because he followed his coworker who apparently had been doing shots of fireball before he hopped in the excavator truck. Uh, the speech was not normal, according to the employee. He appeared to be under the influence of alcohol. A deputy found two empty pints of McCormick vodka and an empty bottle of fireball in the vehicle. <laughs> he, Maybe he, he was says, going out to look for Jimmy Hoffa with that Mr. excavator. Yeah, it, hey, good thinking. Uh, the maybe, maybe man recycler. Anybody think of that? He's just trying to get some cash back for for recycling. No, you know, I think that you're being too generous. Yeah, too generous on that. Rushing denies drinking booze, but apparently all the uh, the bottles found in the car are there. He consented to field sobriety tests, but had knee injuries that could prevent him from doing all the exercises. So the deputy said, "You're impaired." You can't drive this car, and off to the Marion County Jail you go. Wow. Don't the drink. fireball is only 40 proof, so it's like half strength. Uh, oh, it takes a lot man. to get drunk, allegedly. <sighs> this one also includes alcohol. This is a woman in Florida who whacked a man in the head with a hammer during an argument about rum. <laughs> I often fight about <laughs> rum. You know, I mean, in the scheme of things to fight about, Yar. The, rum, rum works. This woman now behind bars after smacking this man in the head during an argument about rum. Her name is Lori Wilds. Smash it. (laughs) Not with your iron rod. She's charged with felony aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. Uh, The victim said he was in a garage when Wilds came in arguing about the missing rum in the home. The man said he doesn't drink rum. iron rod. (laughs) The man said he doesn't drink rum. We're so bad. And that's when Wilds started knocking things over. During her reported rampage, she grabbed the man around his neck and started punching him. The man was able to get away, but that's when Wilds came at him with a hammer. At first, he didn't know what he was hit with. Then he realized it was the blunt side of the hammer. Deputies say there was a small scrape with fresh blood on his head. The hammer, a standard one with a black and blue handle, was found by deputies. They caught up with her. She had also a strong odor of alcohol on her breath. My bad. I'm sorry. Mm. I was going to say maybe it was pirates. but Yeah. She said she only threw a bottle at him and threw his laptop on the floor. But no. She's now... In the Marion County Jail on five hundred dollars. It was wrong. It was stupid, and I'm trying to be a better person. <laughs> Parlay. Maybe she'll hook up with that other guy, and they'll have all kinds of fun in there. I don't know. Mixed drinks. Um, this one, you know, we can't get through Friday Fabulous Florida without a good machete story. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This Florida man was armed with a machete and arrested after an alleged stabbing spree through a family's home. <sighs> man he allegedly stabbed two family members in a home near port st john after uh he was later arrested by law enforcement it happened at about 10 o'clock at night when a woman was heard yelling in her bedroom by her daughter the daughter along with another family member went into the bedroom and saw 39 year old larry spear jr 
choking the woman and stabbing her. Spear allegedly broke an item, struck another family member in the head before walking past them into the kitchen where he grabbed another knife. Deputies say he went back into the bedroom, started stabbing the woman again, then left the home when he realized they had called 911. He was later found at a motel in Titusville where he had locked himself in a bathroom armed with a machete before police took him into custody for attempted murder, murder, aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, aggravated battery on a person older than 65. He has been uh, arrested on 15 felony gun charges in the past and has been to prison twice. Maybe this time it will stick. I don't know. Tom makes a good point. He also has hammer scars on his head. <laughs> He's a little rough around the edges there. That's true. That's the look of regret. <laughs> <laughs> That's a look of this time I'm going to prison for the long haul. Oh, mm. uh, this next video has a pretty dramatic video attached with it. This is a rescue of a pilot who crashed into alligator infested waters in the Everglades. If you're going to oh. have a crash, yeah. We need the water Sully. with Where's the alligators, Sully? no bueno, no bueno. Uh, dramatic videos of the moment when this pilot of an airplane that crash landed into the alligator infested waters of the Florida Everglades. He had to be rescued from the wing of the partially submerged aircraft. Miami-Dade Fire Rescue first responders were alerted to reports of this downed aircraft on Halloween in the area of Max Fish Camp in Broward County. Look at him there. So there, there he is, the pilot being uh, rescued by first responders. Oh, man, at any moment, an alligator could leap straight up. This is the Everglades. This is serious business, right? Miami-Dade firefighter Christopher Kramer said they eventually were able to locate this downed aircraft. And when they arrived, they found the pilot sitting on the plane's wing, as you can see here. Boy, it really sank fast. That was the pilot's uniform? The uh, shorts? The, the, the shorts, yeah. You know... <laughs> You you can you can wear shorts in your so this was all Spirit, right this was Spirit Airlines this is, yeah this is the cheap airlines because this area was not suitable for the rescue helicopter to land they had to lower the first responder down by hoisting him uh, and hoist the rescuer above the helicopter as you can see here they had to dangle by the rope hopefully the rope doesn't snap dropping them into the alligator water. That pilot had been sitting on the wing of the down aircraft since four o'clock in the morning with alligators and mosquitoes and everything else out there. Oh, man. Yeah, he didn't have any water. He was a little dehydrated, but otherwise just minor injuries. And right now it's so, mating season yeah. and they're hungry. I mean, that takes your plane crash to a whole new level. Hello, Florida. We see you. Hello, Zika uh, virus. They have some a little. Yes, yeah, right. They have some anger in Florida sometimes, too. Really? Yeah. Some road rage, even. This Florida man apparently cut a 17-year-old driver off and then punched him in the in the face right through the window of the car. That's mature. <laughs> I guess they're really angry. It was a road rage fit, according to the Marion County Sheriff's Office. Marion has been just, you know, really a treasure trove of stories today. Christopher Gallagher arrested and charged with felony burglary with assault or battery after this incident. The 17-year-old victim told deputies he was driving in the previously mentioned area, searching for an address. Uh, he said a vehicle, later identified as Gallagher's, came up behind him, followed him closely, honked his horn. That's when the 39-year-old began to drive recklessly and tried to pass the teen, according to the teenager. The teen sped up a little bit to keep Gallagher from doing so, but the man... Mm -hmm in turn passed him in the opposite lane of travel before moving back into the correct lane and slamming on his brakes. This almost caused the teen to rear end Gallagher's car. And it wasn't long before Gallagher got out of his car, allegedly approached the teen in, um, in the middle of the street, Gallagher allegedly reaching into the teen's car, punching him twice in the face while yelling obscenities. The first punch landed on the left side of his head, the second to his left arm because he was trying to block Gallagher from hitting him in the face again. After the second punch, the teen accidentally released his foot from the brake, causing his car to roll into the back of Gallagher's car. Accidentally. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Gallagher I think denies As soon this. as somebody jumps out of their car, I think I'm taking off. I'm not waiting. That's not I mean, fake. I, That's yeah. real. I don't know I how you get away from this guy. I'm sure he would have just given chase, right? Gas people, puddle. people are angry. They're just angry. I, I yeah. Um, 
let's talk about an axe story because we have machetes. We also have a nice axe throwing story in Florida today. It's aisle two. When you, when you, you know, roommates, there's always some tension. Well, in this case, a woman threatened a roommate with an axe when she didn't pack fast enough. This woman, uh, Andrea Maureen Cabrera, I'm gonna go with years meth. old. Right now, I'm just going to go with meth. You're going to, that's your uh, hazard to guess. The Angela, Andrea, told her roommate in their living situation wasn't working out. And even though the roommate had just moved in four or five days earlier, oh, deputies wow. say <laughs> she wanted her quick. out. The roommate agreed to leave, said, okay, <laughs> you're right. This isn't working for me either. She asked a friend to come with her to pack up her belongings. As the woman was packing, Cabrera allegedly became verbally abusive, then picked up an axe and told her roommate and her friend they had to pack faster. The roommate told uh, deputies Cabrera bumped her shoulder into hers and went into her bedroom, continuing to verbally abuse them both. The roommate's friend went outside and continued to pack up the car, saying he feared for his life. This is scary. Cabrera told them, chop, 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 hurry up. <laughs> Maybe just and wanted to... her to like experience like the whole thing, like the whole experience, right? Like the whole roommate experience and play it out like very quickly. So this is like phase two. Phase right. two, I come at you with an axe. This is what's going to happen if you stay around. I mean, this escalated quickly. She only yeah. lived there for four or five days. Yeah. Cabrera told deputies she grabbed the axe for protection when the argument escalated. She was taken into custody on charges of assault with a deadly weapon without intention to kill, battery with a prior felony conviction, jail records show. Shocking. They don't say anything about meth, but mm. I mean, I, I have there a hard time. There had to be a crack pipe in there somewhere. You have, yeah, it's very surprising that. What that happened to the prior roommate? Uh, we'll never know. One never knows, yeah. All right. Let's take a look at this last story because this one uh, does include some drugs, and that's a good thing, right? Always a good thing in Florida. Uh, a woman arrested after she tried to smuggle drugs into a Florida prison and give them to an inmate during her visit, but her sh legs were shaking. I guess she was scared and nervous, and so her knees were a knocking, and or that she, gave her away. Or she was doing some of the drugs. Or, or that. You know, you always have a logical explanation for everything. Thank you. Mm. Maria Des Los Angeles Maceo arrested and charged with smuggling contraband into prison, trafficking cocaine, resisting arrest after the incident that went down at the Century Correctional Facility in the Florida Panhandle on Sunday. Maceo visited the prison over the weekend to visit an inmate. Didn't know she'd be staying. Her plan was to use this <laughs> false identity. Do you have any smuggled... vacancies? <laughs> I'm sorry, I need a room for rent. Uh, her plan was to use the false identity, smuggle drugs into the facility, and give them to an inmate during a visit. After making her way inside the prison, she sat next to the inmate, but it was the shaking of her leg that alerted yeah. the corrections officer to her possible suspicious activity. Drugs. So they kept an eye on her. And the deputies or the correction officer saw her allegedly pull two packages out that she was hiding and hand them to the inmate. Calvin wants to know where where was she hiding the drugs? Are we talking hoo ha? Uh, no, I think they were in a pocket. Perhaps she was hiding them in a pocket. Yeah, she hastily Hot tried pocket. to put the packages into the inmate's pocket, and then both packages fell onto the floor. There's a reason that this place no. is fun. Yeah, she wasn't smooth about this one at Get all. nothing! So she tries to pass the drugs, dumps the drugs on the floor while her legs are shaking. Not a good look for those attempting to covertly pass drugs in a prison environment, according to deputies. Then she grabbed the packages, tossed them at the inmate. That's when correction staff sprung into action. They were like, no. They confiscated the packages. Did you really was, just do that? One was filled with suspected marijuana. The other one suspected cocaine. Authorities found at the time she was using a fictitious name. Uh, under her real name was a warrant for arrest in Miami on drug-related charges. So there you go. That's in she goes. Saying. Remains on fifty-five thousand dollars bond, uh, and now her botched drug exchange will be dealt with by prison authorities. On the right-hand side, that also is the look of regret. <laughs> is it though? Well, at least she doesn't a... have any hammer marks on her head. 
she's not a very good criminal, I have to say. It was wrong, it was impressive. stupid, and I'm trying to be a better person. you got to give her points for efficiency, right? Mm. She's helping the criminal justice system speed things yeah. up. How's it looking on the on the uh, the poll? Did we do a poll, Albert? No, maybe a little bit. No poll. All right. Oh, well, I thought I was on. You... Yeah, I do have oh. a poll, and I have a booty patrol, uh, okay. axe, <laughs> axe hammer, machete attacks, pilot rescue, and shaky prison legs as the options. Of okay. course, you can just write your own uh, write in votes in the in the chat as well. And so what's what's ahead at this point? Do we know? Uh, the booty patrol. I think that was pretty yeah. obvious. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, okay. So let's do a recap. It's the booty patrol. The you know the uh, the border patrol truck painted to look like booty patrol. It's the company car in the excavating uh, company where Fireball and vodka was found in the vehicle. A woman whacking a man in the head with a hammer during an argument about rum. A Florida man armed with machete arrested after a stabbing spree in a family home. Dramatic video of the pilot who crashed in the Everglade uh, alligator infested waters and had to be hoisted to safety. A Florida man with a cutting off a 17 year old driver and then punching him through the window. A woman threatening her roommate with an axe for not packing fast enough. And <laughs> the shaky leg prison drug drop. What do you like best, John Daly? I like the shaky leg prison uh, drop off, but I think it's slam dunk. It's got to be booty, 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 booty patrol. <laughs> I'll go with booty patrol. What do you think, Albert? It's hard to go 100%, but I do like the shaky prison leg story because it was a very, it, it was very much a wild idea. Yeah. Considering mm -hmm. she was also a wanted person, and it was never going to work. It was, was yeah. Name. It was <laughs> just like she, she just turned her, she basically turned herself in. So yeah. It was a nice She's try. A, it She's was efficient. a nice try. I'm going to shake it up a little bit and go with the plane rescue into alligator, uh, alligator infested waters because truly only in Florida, right? Do you not, you're not necessarily worried about the plane crash. You're more worried about what happens afterward. So yeah, I'm you don't have to that. specify alligator infested waters. It's Florida. You just, yeah, yeah. Bonus yeah. points yeah. for the, the, that man looked scantily clad and yes. yeah. the, the pilot. Yeah. He, I yeah. don't know what he was wearing or if he was wearing anything. So it's hot in Florida, you know, going for a joy ride. It's okay to just fly your plane in shorts. No problem. Um, okay. So what's the winner on the poll? Do we have a, an official winner? Yeah. Booty patrols, I think booty just patrols. off the headline and just the idea. I think everyone could appreciate a little, uh, I don't know. It's like Levity. It's, it's funny. Yeah. 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 It looks like in the chat, Booty Patrol gets a lot. Shaky leg. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, that is it. That's awesome, Albert. You've outdone yourself today. Wonderful. I uh, I just love all the stories. Thank you so much for that. John Daly, you're awesome. I will see you on the After Party Live at 1 yes, o'clock. right after this show. Where we'll have some more fun. Awesome. Yep. Thank you for being here. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye. This has been Friday Fabulous Florida. There is a gigantic alligator in my kitchen. Y'all come back now, here. Yeah? All right. Let's, uh, gonna go right now to, uh, Mike. Well, I don't know, Albert, should I do news or should we go to Michael Shore and Jim Avila right away? What do you think? Um, let's go, let's go straight into it. Michael's okay. already here. Let's get right. him. Let's give him the, the, the floor since before Jim gets here. So we can get, uh, get started. Oh yeah. We like it when Michael Shore scoops Jim Avila. This is great. Our two favorite journalist friends, both awesome in so many ways and great, uh, at, uh, political analysis as well. Let's welcome Michael Shore to the Mark Thompson show. Good to be here, Kim. How are you? Hi, hi. How are you? And thanks to the fans. For, for are the you at a are you in a hotel somewhere? I'm in a hotel, in a... yes, I'm in a hotel. So uh, are... it's it's not my usual background. Can you hear and see me, or you just see my bed behind me? I, I can see you and some blue, beautiful blue curtains and a a, a very hotel looking headboard. Are you following yeah. Trump rally airs again? I'm not. No, no. This okay. is uh, this is a, a different trip entirely. Okay, okay. There's okay. never been anything well, like this. <laughs> thank you for taking the time to join me. We'll we'll have a uh, Jim Avila pop in when he gets here as well. Right. But I've been watching with rapt attention the New York civil fraud trial where. We had Don Jr. get on the stand and ask the 
the court artist to make him look sexy if you know that was a possibility and he talked about how uh he had nothing he might be his signature on the bottom of the form but he had nothing to do with preparing the numbers that's what they pay the accountants for and then you had eric trump who got got on the stand and according to mary trump basically at one point said I'd never seen these documents before and then admitted that he knew that they existed back in 2013. And then you have Ivanka playing the mom card, trying to get out of even coming to court saying, I'm sorry, weekdays are bad for me. Mm -mm. It's like a family circus at the New York courtroom. Yeah. I mean, and that's what it is. And it seems like the Trump organization was that as well. I mean, I also think this is what the prosecutors wanted to have happen in, in a way, uh, this to, to present uh, people who are being very evasive and and running away from the facts and the signatures. It is not an excuse if you've signed a document to say you haven't read that document when that do document uh, creates fraud. And so I think it's going to be very difficult. And in, in a sense, um, Donald Trump Jr. may have perjured himself in the court, too, in in, an, uh, in another way. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know that. But it cer certainly seemed as if a lot of what he was talking about was uh, was deniable, but not plausible denial. And then he, he it was refuted later when we learned that Eric Trump knew about these things. So I, I think there's a lot more to this that we'll see down the road. Of course, Ivanka Trump, I'm sure at least once has left her kids with her husband or the babysitter. So it's um, <laughs> pretty, um, you know, that's pretty disingenuous. I mean, how many nannies must she have, honestly? Even if she has none, um, uh, you can pull away for a day and get someone to cover you for a few hours to go. You would think so. I think she just doesn't want anything to do with this. I, yeah. And I, I mean, part of me feels her. Who wants to go testify against your brothers and your dad, right? Yeah. That's got to be stressful. But it also has to be a bit of relief because she's not named. And she could have been named, but they, what was it, uh, statute of limitations said that her involvement of this was too long ago yeah I, I, yeah I don't I don't think and I also think that they probably wanted to keep her as somebody who could come to court and do this test and give this testimony I, I also look I mean she did go to work for her dad in, mm -hmm. in the Oval Office if, if you know it, I, there are family constraints where you say oh, you know it is a tough place to be to have to testify against your family right. but um, but she did what what she did and she knows what she knows and that's the most important part of this and he could have avoided this by not having, you know, created this fraud. And they've already been found liable, the, the Trumps and the Trump organization already been found liable for fraud. Now it's just a matter of how much do they have to pay up because of it. So, right. And and, yeah. and also the, the the degrees of it, too. I mean, I think there was, a, mm -hmm. there, there was so much that was inflated that they're they're really fine to fine toothed comb with this now. Yeah. Uh, your friend Jim Avila has arrived. Let's bring him into the broadcast. Good morning, Jim. How's it going? Good morning. How are you? Hi. Oh, you're outside today. All right. I am, yeah. Nice beautiful. Day. Beautiful blue skies. That's that's gorgeous. We're talking about the Trump kids testifying in the fraud trial in New York and kind of the, the circus-like atmosphere. Any thoughts on what's going on with that? Well, I think it's fun. You know, it's fun to watch. <laughs> uh, fun to see, you know, fun to see always fun to see arrogant privileged people uh actually have to sit down and answer some questions and be held to the same kind of scrutiny that the rest of us are yeah and not be able to just harumph and let it go by i mean i guess they've been handling it two different ways uh you know donald trump jr with his uh comment about make my make my courtroom drawing sexy yeah and uh, and then Eric Trump actually getting in a lot of arguments with the uh, with the prosecutors is interesting. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I guess the real circus is going to be Monday when uh, Donald Trump himself is going to take the stand. So we're mm -hmm. looking forward to that. Yeah, that will be very interesting. I I don't know what the strategy would be. Keep him on the stand as a short amount of time as possible, because, you know, he can't keep his mouth closed. You know, who knows what he's going to say up there? Yeah, I imagine that they'll try to keep it short on cross-examination mm -hmm. uh, because they'll want him to get off, but they'll want to try to clear up some things. But how, how do you shut him up? You know, you just you can't. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the attorney, yeah. you know, how the attorney general handles it. Uh, you know, they have some things they want to get out of him and uh, and hopefully they will. 
Let's move to the D.C. federal elections case, because Trump there is under a limited gag order. He asked the judge, Tanya Chutkin, to lift it. She said no. Now he wants her to suspend it for seven days while he appeals to the United States Supreme Court. I I, I don't know. I mean, it, does the Supreme Court, if this gets in front of them, did they side with Trump just because of the, the nature of how many of them were put into place by him and the conservative nature of the court? How does this pan out, Michael? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm I not equipped to answer that question. I, I, I still am a bit of an idealist that the people on the court are going to rule in in terms of what's right on the law. Um, and even though they are conservative, this is not an ideological thing. This is more about the way the law operates. So I don't know that this is about any kind of political ideology or constitutional interpretation. So I I'm I tend to think the court's going to do what's right and they also may not take it up either. Yeah, what do you think Jim? I mean yesterday uh the the back to New York the judge was table thumping mad. You know, the the attorneys for Trump said something about his court clerk and the way she was speaking with him, and they thought that, you know, that she was feeding him information that could sway him. <clears throat> he got so mad, he slammed down on the table and said, don't you talk about my clerk. I, I don't know. I, I don't know how how you, um, as a, a judge in one of these trials, how you keep the, the Trump lawyers, the Trump kids, the Trump, the, the Trump himself quiet. Well, I think <clears throat> yesterday's move was an attempt by the... Um, uh, the, the, or today, it was actually today, mm -hmm. Trump's uh, attorneys today, uh, it was an attempt to to win the day on, in, in the court of public opinion. Uh, you know, everybody, Eric Trump was a terrible witness, but what everybody's talking about, both in the papers and us again today, is the fact that, you know, they had a, a harumph about uh, his clerk talking to him. Now, when I've, I mean, I've covered a lot of court cases and been in a lot of courts and I covered the Supreme Court as well. And I have not seen uh, a judge consult with a court clerk as often as this judge apparently does. Does that mean there's anything wrong with it? I don't think that there is anything wrong with it. I don't think there's, you know, she apparently is uh, an attorney used to, you know, who, who worked uh, in the, if not in the AG's office, in the district attorney's office. She so she has some expertise in these things. So he's getting some guidance from her. I don't think there's anything illegal about that. He makes the decisions. He can get information from mm -hmm. wherever he wants. Uh, but what they're trying to do is win the, the uh, you know, the day's news, the news cycle uh, with bringing up this kind of stuff. And it did. It won the news cycle. That's what everybody's talking about. But it, I don't think, I think it's pretty irrelevant uh, uh, in the in the long run and as far as the other other judge is concerned um i don't think that the supreme court is going to get involved with this i i kind of agree with michael that on most issues that were not of the of, of substance of substance of ideology ideological substance uh the court has has ruled against trump a lot of times including in the elections well speaking of the election the legal wrangling when it, it comes to Trump is apparently still playing in his favor because I was looking at a, a story Mark forwarded me this morning from Politico. They have an exclusive where they look at this anti-Trump group and they've produced four advertisements attacking Trump's legal troubles. And they range from um, saying that the legal troubles will undercut the election. They say Trump has too much baggage. They say Democrats are going to sensationalize the legal trouble and hurt Trump with it. Um, and that Trump will be convicted, leading President Biden to cruise to re-election. So this is the messages of the, in this in these advertisements. And then they looked at voters and they said, how did you think these advertisements, you know, what were your opinion afterward? And I guess it backfired because the people that were supposed to be swayed by these ads apparently were more in Trump's corner after they saw the advertisements. So I don't know how you capitalize on or use the legal trouble that Trump is facing 
to sway voters if voters are then becoming more sympathetic to his plight. Michael, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I I, I don't know. I, I don't I, I and I don't mean to like avoid answering the question. I, yeah. It's something you can't know. You have yeah. somebody who is different than any other candidate for office for president has ever been in terms of what is going on. I think the results of these cases and how neutralized Trump is as a candidate by convictions, by jail, what what have you, uh, I, I think will tell us. But I, I think you just run your person and run your record and hope that, that independent voters still will not be swayed uh, enough to vote for Donald Trump. So what's the strategy, Jim? How, you know, do you, do we talk about the legal troubles at all or just kind of, uh, as Michael is saying, focus on the issues and run the race? But by the way, I, I don't, I think you have to talk about the legal troubles. I just don't think you can concern yourself with their impact. If, if they're not going to, they, they are uh, disqualifying on their, on their surface. Uh, sure. Anybody would want, uh, would not want somebody who was convicted and dealing with all these legal problems to stand for any elected office. Uh, right. Look at what's happening with Biden. Bob Menendez. People are furious about Senator Menendez and what he's done. They want him to resign. Democrats aren't letting him into intelligence briefings. So uh, if, if Republicans were to do the right thing and get rid of Trump, then that would solve the issue. You can't not talk about it. But what I'm saying is you still have to run on on what you are going to do and what you have done just as much. Right. Jim, what are you thinking? Yeah, I, I agree with that, Michael. I think that uh, the best course uh, for Joe Biden is to run as got a friend here, I guess. I heard the honking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, that uh, it, the best course for Joe Biden is to do his job, uh, to continue to be presidential. Uh, you know, the way, you know, his, his, he has bigger problems right now. <laughs> you know, he, he's handling the, the, the Israel situation, uh, you know, and it's, 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 it's a very difficult situation. He has to focus on that. Uh, he's focused on the economy. We, there was some sliding back a little bit today in the economy. Uh, those are more important issues for him to campaign on. Uh, you know, seeing him handle this as a as a statesman, handle what's going on as a statesman is what is going to work out best for him. I, I still think he's to let his, to let his surrogates uh, focus on Donald Trump's problems is the way to do it. Gavin Newsom's very good at it. You know, let Kamala Harris maybe do it. But uh, Joe Biden should be worried uh, about handling the problems that are out there because they're so they're so thick and so difficult. Yeah. Um, since you mentioned what's going on in the Middle East, let's talk about that for a moment, because uh, Antony Blinken uh, went to Israel trying to maybe say lighten up on Gaza a, a bit. Netanyahu today saying we're not going to lighten up until all the hostages are released. And still from the White House, there's no uh, definitive, you know, we're calling for a ceasefire. They're kind of backing away from that whole ceasefire <clears throat> thing a little bit. And so you you mentioned you think that President Biden is handling this the right way. Should he be calling for a ceasefire? Should America be doing more? Well, I think he's made some mistakes. I think the mistake he made <clears throat> saying that he didn't believe that the... Um, that the that the figures that the casualty figures coming out of of the uh, Palestinian uh, medical people uh, were, were accurate, uh, I think that was a mistake and really turned a lot of other people otherwise people who otherwise would support him against him in the Arab world uh, and in the and in the United States Arab population. Uh, sorry, we have a helicopter now. It, outside is quiet as you would think. Yeah, you're busy out there. He's, you're an indoor cat. Just, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think that um, that it's that he has made well, he's made some mistakes in general. He gets pretty good marks. Um, I think the United States, I, I think he has called for a ceasefire in a not direct way that puts Israel in a in a difficult bind. What he's done is called for uh, a series, what he called what they're calling a series of pauses mm -hmm. uh, to let humanitarian uh, material get through. That is a wise thing to call for. You know, the Israelis have rejected that so far, but it's possible that they're just rejecting that in public. They may pull back a bit when Anthony Blinken goes all the way over to Israel. It's hard to ignore him. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I would, I would think that they're going to take that, take heed in that. And it, it's a difficult situation because 
you know, I, I don't think that the majority of, of American Jews uh, are going to turn against uh, going to turn against Joe Biden versus uh, Donald Trump. Trump made some inroads about when he supported Jerusalem being the capital, moving the embassy there, that kind of thing. But in general, the Democrats have always had a lock on the on the Jewish vote. Uh, and I don't see where the Palestinians or the Arabs are, while they may be angry at Joe Biden, they're going to go after the guy, they're going to go for the guy who wanted to shut all, who still wants to shut all Muslims from coming into this country. I don't think that that's going to happen. So uh, while it's a difficult situation, I think Joe Biden is still in a good place. Yeah, Michael? I mean, I think that, that, that Jim's right, but I think that, that Biden, in order, just calling for a ceasefire is not enough from the Americans. I, I think that there has to be a plan. Joe Biden, when he was the head of the Foreign Relations Committee, when he was chairman there, uh, always had plans. He always, uh, even on uh, when he was a uh, first ran or second time he ran for president unsuccessfully, had a tripartite plan for Iraq. There's always a plan. And so calling for a ceasefire while OK and maybe necessary, you also have to play Israel's hand for them. And you have to say, yes, I, I think Israel should have a ceasefire in exchange. They have to get the demilitarization of Hamas, the release of the hostages, and to have some of the perpetrators of what happened on October 7th turned over to them. And then there will be a ceasefire. One thing that they have to play on, there is a sentiment in Gaza that's not anecdotal, where, where many people who are in Gaza, many uh, of these people who have been enduring this for decades, uh, and certainly worse over the last 15 years, are saying they're not blaming Israel. They're blaming Hamas. Hamas put them in this bind. It's not the overwhelming sentiment, but it does exist and it exists in, in real numbers. So I think that there is a way to play into that for the Americans as well. This has to be played on both sides to a degree. But Israel is the horse that America always has in this race. And, and I agree. I, you're not going to get look, look, American Jews don't think about the capital being in Jerusalem. They don't think uh, necessarily about um, uh, some of the issues that that Israelis get upset about, and rightly so. It's more about the human aspect of it. So when there is sympathy for uh, the oppressed in America from American Jews, whether it's historical here in the civil rights movement and, and, and beyond and Black Lives Matter even, um, it, it's always been that side of it. So I don't think that there, you're going to lose that from uh, from Joe Biden, but, but like Jim says, but I do think that Biden has to be a little more proactive in in and the White House has to be a little bit more proactive uh, in, in the way they are asking for ceasefires and asking for draws da drawdowns because they do need to put in a plan over there. Otherwise, just stopping isn't going to change anything. But it's a bit tricky, though, uh, I would say, Kim and Michael, in that, you know, Israel will get its back up uh, if it looks like we're telling them what to do with this plan. Now, they, we may have a plan we don't know about that he's talking to. That Lincoln That's true. I assume we do, actually. Yeah. Yeah. That he's talking to them in private. You can't do it in public uh, so much because then it looks like, you know, they're a puppet. Right. And that that we don't want that, you know, the United there States has to be some narrative. Jim. There has to be some narrative that gets out publicly to, to answer what Kim's asking, which is the politics of it. Right. I mean, that we are going to a presidential election. We have a president who is, you know, uh, uh, teetering when, when it comes to um, the, the the support he's getting in national polls and state polls. So there has to be. I totally agree with what you're saying. There, there's definitely something going on. There have to be nibbles that the public can have to know that that's going on. Nibbles, little nibbles. Let's talk about what the Biden administration is doing today. Uh, this is trying to strengthen economic ties with Latin America in an effort to slow down the... Um, flow of migrants into the United States. We've already seen in New York where they're giving people free plane tickets to get out of New York because there's so many migrants there, they can't handle them all. And so President Biden is hosting officials from 11 countries in the Western Hemisphere. That's today. He's announcing new initiatives aimed at boosting the economies of Latin American countries so that they can absorb the migrants instead of people coming into America. Um, he's faced some pretty harsh criticism for the way he's handled what's happening at the border. Does this make a difference come the election? Is is uh, strengthening the economies of other countries the right way to handle it? I'll let you go with Jim. Um, and Jim. <laughs> so I think, you know, that they, this is a very difficult issue, and it's an issue that is, is yes, is, is gaining ground 
uh, it has some traction. And I think that um, the Biden administration has not addressed it in the way they need to address it. And the way they need to address it, I've said this before in this program, is they need to propose a comprehensive immigration reform bill in the Senate that will pass there and then put the pressure on the House and then be able to say this is a political move. OK, I'm not going to I'm not saying this is going to solve the problem. It's right. a polit- this is a political chess move. Then they have to put the onus on the House to turn that down. And then the Biden administration can say, wait a minute, we have a solution. We proposed a solution. You have turned it down and you've done nothing in the now 10 years uh, since comprehensive immigration reform was first proposed and was accepted bipartisan in a bipartisan way, and you continue to knock it down. It's your problem, not ours. And that's what they have to do politically, and they have not done it. Now, on a, on a, as far as on a day-to-day way to tr- actually tr- try to solve the problem, you know, I, gu- I guess, are we going to fix the economies of all of Latin America? I don't think so. You know, even even right now, Argentina is in a terrible place, you know, pl- places we never thought were in a bad place. So uh, and, and these are new countries that are coming to us. Venezuela, an oil rich country. Those right. folks are pouring out of the country and coming in, coming here. So, you know, they're ha- on a day to day basis. I don't think that's the answer. It does give them some cover. But the real cover is politically is going to be proposing an actual comprehensive immigration bill. Michael? And, and this meeting should have happened in 2021, not 2023, frankly. I think that this is uh, it, when, when he put the vice president in charge of this, when it was clear that he wanted to approach immigration in a different way at the roots of immigration, as it was called, they should have put more behind it then. Now it does seem like he's cramming for a test next year and, and the <laughs> politics of it are, are good. And the actual uh, part of it that is good is that you get these countries working together as a unit, not as just Mexico, just El Salvador, just Honduras because all these problems happen in each of them and and we have to deal with it at the end. So I, I do think that, you know, but what Jim's saying is true. There has to be some kind of action from Congress and the White House can spur that, especially when they have a tenuous hold on the Senate and it looks, uh, the map does not look great for Democrats in the Senate next, uh, next year. Speaking of the Senate, California Senate race, new poll out today shows Katie Porter and Adam Schiff kind of neck and neck. It was Katie Porter with 16%, uh, 17% rather, Adam Schiff with 16%, according to this latest Berkeley IGS poll of likely primary voters. So uh, both Democrats, they say, well-funded. 10% of those surveyed said they plan to vote for former Los Angeles Dodgers great Steve Garvey, who's running as a Republican in this race. Uh, He just started his campaign last month. 30%, though, say they're undecided. So we've got Porter with 17, Schiff with 16, and then uh, Steve Garvey with 10%. I don't know how this uh, if if this poll makes a difference or shows what's how we're headed. Bar- what's the number that Barbara Lee gets in that? Is there? A- she's not even mentioned. Yeah, she's no. Not- yeah. mm. um, so I, you know, nobody's paying attention to this kid. I mean, I, honestly, <laughs> I, I mean it. It's it's just something that nobody's paying attention to now. It's it's more than a year, just about a year away from that general election. There'll be a primary. It will likely be Schiff and Porter who go to the top two. Uh, yeah. And so I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm always sort of a curmudgeon about polls at this point a year out. Um, so it doesn't, you know, it helps with fundraising for both of them, but that they're neck and neck. They can each play off of it. Schiff can say, look, uh, she's catching us. She's ahead of us. Uh, Porter can say we can do this and, and it's good for fundraising, but it doesn't, you know, I don't think the tea leaves change. Yeah, at this point, at this point, I think, uh, Kim and Mike, that this is a name recognition poll this yeah. this, this early on. So. Who has the more recognizable names? Uh, certainly Schiff and Katie Porter, because they've done a good job of being high profile uh, in their respective uh, places. Uh, you know, the, I, I, this, the campaign hasn't even started. I, it, it really isn't, as Michael says, it's a kind of an unimportant poll. Yeah, Uh, I think it's interesting, though, just to show where we are right now and how things can change down the road. And I thought that Lee would be more of a competitor in this race. So that did surprise me a bit. Well, you know, I think you have to give her some time. She's not as well known outside of Southern California as the other two. Outside the Bay Area, because she's she's Oakland. I mean, we know her very well. 
yeah. we know her as the lone voice against the war in Iraq, right? She's taking stands that no one else is taking. She's a, uh, she's brave. She's courageous. That was, that was also twenty years ago. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't. I don't think her. She's a. She's a. A name that is as recognizable as those other two, uh, yeah. especially you know, Katie Porter's done a great job with the, with the whiteboards and making herself known as somebody mm-hmm. who can, who can make a make an, an impact. And yeah. Schiff, of course, uh, led the led the charge against Donald Trump. So and Democratic money speak. goes to the Democratic, the more prominent Democratic mainstream yeah. na- mainstream names. Right. Uh, and that in this case would be would really be Schiff, uh, and then uh, pretty close with with Porter. Did you guys hear this Ron DeSantis bizarre new challenge to Trump saying, if you show up to the next uh, debate, Republican debate, which is to be held next week, he's offering to put a boot on his head. What? Yes. He said, it's time for substance. If Donald Trump can summon the balls to show up to the debate, I'll wear a boot on my head. Uh, and this after speculation that he his cowboy boots are he's wearing them with lifts in them to make him appear taller. So I don't know. Uh, is is it just a more nonsensical? It doesn't matter. No one's looking at, at that kind of bluster. Or is DeSantis falling so far now that he's become so irrelevant that he has to come out and say these type of things? It's silly, well, desperate, and um, it's not presidential, and it's yeah, but it doesn't matter either. Yeah, he and he's he is slipping, and uh, you know the latest polls in in the states show that uh, that Nikki Haley is uh, gaining ground, and in fact ahead of him in some places. I was uh, reading an article that this is her, she's having a moment, right? That this is her kind of her moment to rise. Yeah, yeah. As long as Donald Trump is is thirty points ahead of her, it's 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 a moment yeah. to finish second, and it's not really a moment to finish first. So that that's the problem, you know. It, but it's good to be where she's at because, you know, with with Trump's courtroom problems, uh, you know, we don't know how this is going to end. This this story has not been told, and he may not be around for that race, uh, for the actual you know primaries even. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's interesting though to follow all the uh, everything that's happening, and I don't think that whatever challenge that DeSantis throws down will make a difference at, or get Trump to show up for a debate. He's so far ahead; he just doesn't have to. And why would he? Yeah, yeah. and they, there is one other issue that uh, I, I'm not sure if you if you read it yet uh, because it came out maybe while you were on the air was what's going on in Georgia with uh, uh, with with one of the uh, yeah. def- there. Uh, and their motion, which is being considered uh, by the judge, uh, to reopen the the all of the Georgia records about whether or not that was a fair election or not, to mm-hmm. let them litigate that. That is, if they have to get all of those documents, that is a delay that will go way past summer, uh, and so we'll delay that trial, which which many people believe is the most dangerous trial for Do- Donald Trump. That is a significant delay. I kind of think that the judge is going to find a way to get around that and, and not allow them to do it. But but there is a chance. And, and there will be other tactics like that used in a lot of these cases, I'm certain, uh, to try yeah. and de- delay these as well. Guys, I actually have to peel off. Oh, so I'm good to see you. Guys. Thank yeah, you. Have a great time. And thanks for joining us from the hotel. Of course. Yeah, take care. Bye, <laughs> bye yeah. Michael Shore. And Jim Avila, thank you for joining us from the bayou. Yeah. We appreciate yeah. it where the nature is uh, is abounding there. <laughs> it sure sounds like it anyway. I'm actually just in West Hollywood, but it's Oh, uh, are you? Yeah. It's a what? beautiful day in West Hollywood. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about this case because I want to make sure I understand what's happening cuz this judge in Fulton County, Georgia is hearing arguments today in the racketeering case involving Donald Trump. The lawyers for three agencies subpoenaed by one of the defendants are expected to present their arguments. They have uh Harrison Floyd, the director of Black Voices for Trump during the 2020 election, they've subpoenaed the Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger's office, the Fulton County Board of Registration and Elections, and the Clerk of Superior Court of Fulton County, all as part of the defense. Floyd allegedly tried to coerce a so-called confession from an election worker who was falsely accused of rigging the race for President Joe Biden. That never happened. So is it a delay tactic or is there something here? It's a delay tactic. Uh, it is, 
if they have to do that and relitigate the entire Georgia election by bringing in, so they want to bring in all these ballots. They want to bring in uh, the the records uh, that they tried to steal before, mm -hmm. but now they want to bring them in and, and claim that the election was in fact stolen. They want to open it all up and make this case about their defense would be, we didn't know because it wasn't true. That, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, we, we didn't know that this was uh, a true election because it wasn't. And mm -hmm. here's the proof of it. They're not going to get there, but what they are going to do is attempt to delay it and delay it. And the judge did not shut them down entirely. He said that he will, and he's going to look at it and write an opinion. Uh, but I, I don't see him allowing that to happen. It would just be total chaos. Yeah, uh, I guess something else to watch for and all these delays coming. I, I, I Do you think that they don't want any of this to be dealt with before the election, that they they really just want to push it all out till afterward? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because they push it out till afterwards and Donald Trump will uh, get the U the U.S. attorney, his whoever he appoints as the yeah. as the attorney Everything general to way. dismiss all the federal charges. Yeah. And uh and, and in local, there'll be a, in, in the state charges, he'll, there'll be intense pressure uh, to uh, get that overturned or he'll pardon himself yeah. in some way. Uh, although get, pardoning himself for a state charge is more difficult. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, these are all delay tactics. Uh, these are all uh, tactics not to face justice. And uh, I, I think that most so far, uh, even, even the judge in Florida uh, who was asked to delay and thought she was going to take it under consideration, mm -hmm. um, did come back and deny the motion to delay. She continues to hold the calendar. Uh, at she, at during the first hearing, she said, well, I'm not sure we can get all this done and blah, blah, blah. And you thought for sure she was setting up for a delay, and then she didn't. So yeah. the judges are holding pretty firm on this. The, the, real, the real mystery is going to be if, in Mon if on Monday in the new in new york civil court uh if trump is going to do something that was going to land him in jail uh or if uh if he's going to be held in contempt in any of these other places and go to jail even before and what the effect that will have uh on the on the voting public uh yeah. because as we pointed out you know it'll rile up his base still his base only remains 35 to 40 percent of the electoral public that's not really a problem uh, so the real issue is how it will affect the independence. I'm still of the mind that independence will be repulsed by that kind of uh, that kind of activity by Donald Trump and not brought to him. Yeah, you're talking about riling up the base and I, I, our interview is coming to a close here. But I was looking at this story with uh, Trump at a recent rally where he he had a song. He did you know he, Trump has a song? Did you see this? He's got this song and he it features him and January 6th rioters and he opened his Houston rally with it yesterday. He says Trump says the pledge of allegiance on the song while 20 men imprisoned for their role in the insurrection oh. sing the national anthem and he said it's better it's bigger than than Taylor Swift and Miley Cyrus and all these people and it's outrageous. I just, he said that song came out, it went to number one, it's beating everybody. Justice for All is the name of the song. And to me, it couldn't be more wrong. I, I, I don't understand how he gets away with it. Yeah, I mean, I've heard it. I've heard of it. Uh, he's been doing that for, I think, about a month, if I'm not, Has he? not correct. And he's uh, with the, with the, with the uh, people who were arrested and, uh, and sent to jail uh, for the January 6th. Uh, they do. They sing it, and he, you know, they've made a big deal out of it. You know, I don't know where he gets. It's like everything. He inflates everything. I, I don't. I'm it's not buying. It. It's I'm outrageous. Not downloading. You know, people aren't downloading it. The, the real public are not downloading it. His thirty percent, no. maybe, but you know, who cares? Yeah. We have to. We have to be confident enough. And if we're not, then what are we doing here? We have right. to be confident enough in our own people. If not, then we all move to Spain or someplace yeah. else because he, you know, this 30%, I don't, I don't give them anything. 
you know, I'm, I'm not saying we ignore them totally, but yeah. we get pretty close to ignoring their outrageous stuff. I do. Well, we have outrageous behavior in the House. They can't even decide to expel a, the Santos, the lying liar who lies, right? They can't even do that. I guess it's okay if he's our liar who lies. Then then it's all right. Yeah, that that is kind of a complicated issue, and it was brought complicated to me by uh, Raskin, uh, who actually voted against expelling him and, and put a pretty thoughtful piece out about why he did that. And the fact that it sets a precedent without somebody being convicted, just charged. Uh, and so once he's convicted, that he wants to wait till he's convicted. Mm -hmm. You know, look, I don't think he deserves to be there, but the, the, the people who, you know, ignored whatever issues he had and elected him, they have him for yeah. two years. Fortunately, it's only two years and, you know, we'll get rid of him very soon. In 2024, he's not going to win anything. So, yeah. Hallelujah. Jim Avila, thank you for joining us from uh, the amazing Hollywood area where the skies are blue and the, the birds are, are plen plentiful and chirping. And I hope that I get to see you early next week. I'll call you because Mark is off for a couple days. So I'd love to have you back in. Are you working on any pieces for Barrett News Media? Uh, yeah, I have a piece for, that'll run that'll run Tuesday. So I'll, I'll okay. write. Yeah. All right. Then come back okay. on the show. Thanks for hanging thank out. You. Take care. Bye, Bye, Jim. Bye. Jim Avila, Michael Shore, always great on Friday. We love to have them in to talk about politics and uh, and everything else. Albert, what do you think? Are we doing uh, news? Are we doing movies? What do you want? Let's take a quick break for you. You've been talking okay. for a long time. I will play a <laughs> sweep here. And then if uh, Michael Snyder isn't back by then, maybe uh, like a maybe a small turbo news. Sure, we can do it. And then we'll get to Michael, who has, okay. I think, four offerings for us today. So, Oh, nice. I'm, I'm guessing right. he'll be here any minute. Okay, yeah. I'm yeah. with you. We'll be right back on The Mark Thompson Show. Feel it in your soul. The Mark Thompson Show. Thompson Show. Mask it with your iron rod. Who's Mark Thompson? Hey, which one of you is Mark Thompson? What he's got going here is a situation. It's unbelievably offensive. Put up your pants, my man. Pull up those pants. Ralph Nader just sent me a book. Did he send you one too? I offer this sincere apology to you today. Everything is going extremely well. Call me a liar. Now what you call me? You, sir, are a liar. You are a cover-up artist and you are a liar. Why a liar? Your pants are on fire! A Google told me. Can you let him finish, sir? It was wrong, it was stupid, and I'm trying to be a better person. No, no, no. I'm going to tell you what I think. What are the porn stars doing with you? Do you have a secret count? Isn't anybody been a weed? It's 100% effective. How about that? Say what? And this is the new home. There is no defense for my conduct. I misspoke. I stand corrected. And I wanted to apologize to the Asian community, the Asian American community. Time's up, mother effers. So, yes, it is. Mark has the day off. I'm Kim McAllister in for Mark Thompson today. Before we do anything else, please click the like button. If you haven't subscribed to the Mark Thompson show, please Smash click it subscribe with your as iron well. Rod. Smash it as hard as you can. Well, maybe not as hard as you can. At least smash it a little bit. So thank you for subscribing, clicking like and subscribe. Oh, Luis, uh, thank you so much for the $5 super sticker. And thank Luis you says so, Oregon. Thank you so much. 
is a threat to Albert's low bar philosophy. How can you lower a bar that has been erased and is no longer there? <laughs> Louise. Albert appreciates the shout out and thank you for the five dollar super sticker. We uh we appreciate it. of course the show is crowdfunded and so we thank you so much. I just got a message from viewer listener Julie who is informing me that today is Shadow Stevens' birthday. Of course, Shadow Stevens, a friend of the show, seventy seven years old today for Shadow what? Stevens. What? So yeah, yeah. So we celebrate Shadow Stevens and his birthday, and that's awesome. So thank you for that information. The Mark Thompson Show. Mm -hmm. Let's bring it into the movies, right, Albert? We'll take a look at what is going on at the box office with Michael Snyder, who it's always a ding-a-thon, ding-fest when he joins the show to talk about the latest offerings at the box office. Is that right, Albert? Yes. He is here. All right. On the rainbow. He comes and goes on a rainbow. No one says it like Mark says it. Hi, Michael Snyder. How are you? I'm fine. Happy to be here with Kim Possible and uh, Alberto the Magnificent. And, uh, you know, it's been nonstop fun since last weekend with Halloween parties that yeah. lasted into the wee hours of October 31st, followed by the solemnity of All Saints Day and yeah. yesterday's uh, Day of the Dead celebration. And by the way, yeah. for Day of the Dead, uh, I tried to contact the ghost of Jerry Garcia on the astral plane <laughs> until a friend informed me that the holiday had nothing to do with that day. Where are my uh, weed so, smokers at? Yeah. Okay. yeah I, was, I was grateful for the correction. Oh, oh. anyway. Um, what, did, what did you dress up as for Halloween this year? Uh, I was a bohemian ne'er-do-well. Oh, wait, wait. That's oh, my wait. <laughs> normal baseline existence. Uh, yeah, anyway, so um, oh. uh, speaking of uh, speaking of the dead, Elvis Presley, okay? Because we yeah. really should get into film reviews, and we're going to kick things off with Priscilla. Uh, we have had a, a heaping helping of Baz Luhrmann's kinetic candy-colored Elvis biopic. And the rollicking Netflix animated series Agent Elvis, which uh, suggests that uh, uh, the, during his uh, career, at the height of it, in fact, he became an agent for a super secret organization. You remember those shots of Elvis with uh, Nixon getting, uh, you know, the FBI badge or whatever it was? Yeah. This, this suggests that Elvis indeed was part of a uh, black ops organization. And it's very funny, and I enjoyed it. But, you know... Back to back, Elvis and Agent Elvis, and now here comes Sofia Coppola's, or is that Sofia Coppola's mm -hmm. movie about the king, or more specifically his queen, Priscilla, yeah. uh, taking a sideways look at Elvis through the eyes of his teenage sweetheart, eventual wife, and, and of course, inevitable widow, Priscilla Boulot Presley. Uh, mother, by the way, to the late Lisa Marie and grandma to the talented actress and filmmaker Riley Keough. And Priscilla was good. I mean, from the time when Elvis stationed in Germany during his stint in the army meets 14-year-old Priscilla, daughter of an army officer, and is smitten with her. That's right. She was 14. Deal with it. Uh, through their courtship eventual mm -hmm. marriage and all the personal turbulence and showbiz hysteria that followed Coppola tries to fashion something deep and resonant about the woman in the maelstrom and the price of celebrity uh, better uh, put the toll taken by the gift of fame and fortune but its episodic approach often felt muddled and scattershot to me which was kind of not helped by the murky cinematography in some sections. I mean, the sequences in Germany look like uh, they were shot all in natural light um, and um, not a lot of it. Uh, and there's also, you know, moments of mumbled overlapping dialogue probably meant to give the movie a cinema verite, you are there feel. And of course, you know, Elvis was a noted mumbler, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so that was uh, probably expected. And I have to say there are things to admire here, but mostly I have to say Kaylee Spaney's performance as Priscilla carries this. She does a beautiful, beautiful job. I've never uh, heard of her before. Is she new on the scene? No, she's been in a few films before. It's okay. just that she's never had a starring role like this. And okay. uh, uh, Coppola has given her this uh, lovely showpiece to uh, display her skills. Mm -hmm. Look, no one 
is touching Austin Butler's Elvis from the Lerman movie. Yeah. But Jacob Elordi was solid here as uh, as Mr. Presley. Still, I you know, I was not blown away by this. Uh, could I be suffering from Elvis fatigue after Elvis and aged Elvis? That's it's possible. A, it's a lot of Elvis. I know. By the way, uh, I should point out it's a, it's fair to know uh, straight up that both Agent Elvis and Priscilla were co-produced and thus heartily endorsed by Priscilla herself. And the movie, I mean, it offers a real insider's take on her experience and the trials of being the wife of Elvis. I, I just wish it didn't leave me so cold and unsympathetic to the couple. What's and, interesting you know, about this is I was reading this article where Lisa Marie Presley spoke out about this before she died, and she called this movie vengeful. She said it's negative, it makes her dad look awful, and she doesn't. She called on Sophia, uh, the the uh, Coppola, to say, "Don't do this movie. This is way too negative." Wow, you know, uh, I we know so much about the uh, seamy side of Elvis's life, you know, and. Uh, particularly the uh, end of it and uh, his, you know, bloated stint in Vegas and, mm -hmm. and how he died and what have you, uh, that uh, there's already a lot of negativity in the air about certain aspects uh, of the Elvis Presley story. So I don't know if, if you could really uh, call it vengeful or evil. I guess they tried to be even handed and clearly Priscilla loved him. Um, and yet, you know, I can see how Lisa Marie might have been a little put off about it. Then again, right. I don't know what her mental state was at the time. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, it's it's all water under the bridge. By, I, I, one more little note. There's very little classic Elvis movie mu music or Elvis music here, whether it's for the rights reasons or because of creative decisions. But it might be instructive to remember the lyrics to Suspicious Minds, one of his big hits, when considering Priscilla's story, I'm caught in a trap. I can't get out because I love you too much, baby. So, I mean, when you think about that and you think about their relationship, mm -hmm. um, there is something very, uh, there's your resonance right there. Anyway, yeah. um, Priscilla is in theaters and uh, I think it's going to be a good watch at home as well. Um, you know, um, are you recommending I it? Um, tentatively, I, I wasn't crazy okay. about it. And again, I think uh, burnout probably mm -hmm. contributed to my uh, shrug worthy response, you know? Okay. Um, all right. Let me talk about something that is not a great movie, but I enjoyed immensely a uh, quiz lady, which you can watch on Hulu and has a lot of talent involved. Quiz lady is a comedy with, um, some family drama woven in here and there about, um, a young woman who uh, is the little sister of a troublemaking, uh, egomaniacal, uh, narcissistic elder sister. Uh, and uh, the younger girl has spent her life fixated on a game show. And this game show has been like, you know, a uh, manna to her. She loves it. She watches it. She is obsessed by it. And she's very, very smart. And she works in kind of a cubicle drone job. Mm -hmm. And the only joy she gets is from watching this quiz show. And what happens is her sister, who has been out of the picture, shows up needing money, kind of desperate. And circumstances develop where the girl, the younger woman, rather, has to audition for the show in order to get the finances to basically pay off a debt that their ne'er-do-well gambling mom has rung up with a, a local um, criminal. So yeah. uh, Aquafina plays the young woman and Sandra Oh in an absolutely fantastic comedic performance. Mm -hmm. Aquafina is kind of the straight person here as the, uh, the, the quiz loving younger sister. Uh, Sandra Oh is absolutely great as Jenny, the older sister, while uh, Anne, you know, is basically beleaguered for most of the movie and has to step up and, audition and be a part of the show, um, which, by the way, is hosted um, by an actor that we love. And that would be, of course, Will Ferrell, who plays oh, the Will host Ferrell. of the show. Okay. Uh, there's, there's supporting work uh, by Tony Hale. Holland Taylor plays the cranky woman who lives next door to Anne. Jason Schwartzman is in the movie as like the... Um, what the 80 time champion of the show that um, our heroine uh, Anne has to dethrone in order to kind of make the money she needs to pay off the big debt. Uh, and 
I, I was very entertained by the movie. It's not a great film, but it is funny. And man, Sandra Oh has got skills. She she can do drama. She can do action. She can do comedy. And here she's totally in her element. So um, I give this a tentative thumbs up. Uh, okay. Again, you can watch it on Hulu, directed by Jessica Yu, uh, written by Jen D'Angelo. Um, uh, by the way, Tony Hale, who you might know from Veep, who played uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus's uh, kind of a fixer associate on Veep, plays the uh, owner of a Ben Franklin themed inn in Philadelphia, <laughs> and he's dressed as Ben Franklin, and it's it's really a funny set of sequences with Tony Hale. Um, I, yeah, I enjoyed Quiz Lady. What can I tell you? It's not great, but uh, it's it's not a waste of your time whatsoever. Okay, cool. Quiz Lady. I've seen the advertisements pop up when I'm playing Words with Friends, and they're really long. So I was kind of like, what is this? And why is it on my screen? And now I think maybe it's something that I could watch. So cool. It's cute. You can watch it with your kids. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's fun. And Will Ferrell in a supporting role. Um, you know, I didn't think much of his performance in Barbie. But here he's truly in his element. He plays kind of a, an Alex Trebek type. And in fact, this quiz show mm -hmm. that they do, this fictional quiz show is very much a Jeopardy style um, program. Uh, Jason Schwartzman is very funny as the arrogant, you know, multi time champion who can't believe that this right. timid girl is going to possibly dethrone him. Anyway, I don't want to say much more about it. Okay. Let's move on to The Marsh King's Daughter, which mm -hmm. is kind of a crime drama. It's a thriller, um, and uh, it's okay. Uh, basically, it concerns um, a young woman who, as a child, was raised by her father and mother in the wilderness, uh, the wilderness of Michigan. And her father was sort of like a back-to-the-land survivalist type, and it turns out that there's a really ugly backstory as to why they're out there. And eventually she grows up and becomes a more conventional um, the citizen uh, in, in a city with a husband and a daughter. But her father, who is, shall we say, unhinged, is always lurking and could possibly come back and ruin her life. And she basically has to lean on all the skills that he taught her when she was a child to somehow protect her own family. And that sounds uh, they, almost like horror and thriller at the same time. It kind of is. Daisy mm -hmm. Ridley plays the grown-up Helena. Uh, she's pretty damn good. You know her as Ray from the Star, uh, Star Wars movies. And Ben Mendelsohn plays her dad, who becomes known as the Marsh King for what... Uh, he's done in his dark past. And um, Mendelssohn uh, is a really good uh, actor from the UK. Uh, he was in uh, Secret Invasion, the recent Marvel thing with Samuel L. Jackson, mm -hmm. um, playing Talos, the scroll. He's also been in a couple other Marvel films. And here he's completely not that guy. A totally different character. Uh, very well acted. I have to say uh, also that Neil Berger was the director here, and he directed two movies I am incredibly fond of, The Illusionist and Limitless, which actually the latter spawning a TV series, mm -hmm. uh, and the movie Limitless starring, among other people, Bradley Cooper. This is not up to those movies. The Marsh King's Daughter is not at that level. But despite, despite a predictable script, it was engrossing enough to merit home viewing uh, at very least, thanks to the solid direction, visually expansive wilderness settings, and again, really good acting. The Marsh King's Daughter, it's okay. I mean, we're okay. we're sort of on the fence this weekend about these movies. Is this one in the movie theater or is it on TV? It is currently in theaters, and I assume it's going to eventually uh, end up uh, uh, streaming. And, uh, you know, uh, the script was, was okay. I, I mean, I really feel like nothing has blown me away this weekend and uh, i wish i had better news right i don't know what can you say not even the kill room the kill room might have blown you away no well i, well, I will mention the kill room uh, the kill room is sort of a satire of art it's also a bit of a thriller and it has a pretty uh, impressive uh, triumvirate of actors at the head that's a big uh, word the, for sure cast. i oh, mean yeah. Ooh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, Uma Thurman uh, plays a failing, um, a failing art, uh, art gallery owner and hostess. And Sam Jackson plays a, uh, a criminal uh, who has a money laundering scheme that he's going to try to get her to help out with. 
mm-hmm. by base uh, by selling off fake paintings and then getting clean checks, she gets a percentage. So her art gallery business is failing. She's being humiliated by her fellow gallery owners and art connoisseurs, and she has to do something to revive her business. So she agrees to go into business with Sam Jackson's uh, criminal boss, uh, who has a hitman who he convinces, and the hitman is played by Joe Manginello, and he convinces him to do some abstract paintings and inadvertently, the guy becomes the toast of the art world. So I, there are some amusing moments here. This is, again, not a great film, but, you know, the cast is so good and the idea is sort of cute. And the, and the, um, the conceit of a brutal murdering hitman becoming the toast of the, the art world is kind of fun and cool. Uh, he. <laughs> I don't want to reveal some of the visual gags here. And, and when I say gag, I do mean occasionally <coughs> that kind of gagging. Mm. But um, there are some moments uh, um, not great uh, directed by Nicole Peone and written by Jonathan Jacobson. It's uh, definitely a home viewing thing. It's in theaters right now, but you can also stream it on various uh, streaming services, including Amazon um, and Prime Video. Uh, so, you know, the, the the hit room, the kill room, rather. I, I thought it was it was OK, you know. OK, OK. So let's review. You said Priscilla, you weren't crazy about it. You had Elvis Overload. That one's in theaters. You said the quiz lady, entertaining and funny. Uh, and you kind of liked it, but not overboard. You weren't. Overboard no, no, it. It, it's it's solid entertainment, but it's yeah. you know, kind of forgettable. Uh, Marsh King's daughter, you said that's okay. It's a thriller. It's in theaters. And then the kill room, you said, Meh, it's all right. Uh, that it it's in theaters, but you think it's a, it's you wait to, for that one to come to your no, house. No, it's it's already available on streaming. Oh, it's streaming. You, okay, you, you don't have to wait. And it has yeah. its moments, but again, it, these movies are not the most memorable of the four. Is probably um, Priscilla, but I think it's flawed. And I do think the most fun is uh, Quiz Lady. Uh, quickly, let's talk a bit about television. May oh, we? Oh, please. Yes. What's on TV? Okay. We are a number of episodes into the sequel to the uh, award-winning, long-running sitcom, Frasier, uh, about uh, the pompous call-in radio psychologist uh, of Frasier Crane, played by pompous right-winger Kelsey Grammer. <laughs> And uh, the show was about his interactions with family and friends in Seattle. And that was, you know, spun off an equally successful sitcom called sure. Cheers, yeah. set in Boston. So it's years later. Kelsey got to eat. They've done a revival. <laughs> so uh, Frazier, I haven't seen it. Do you like the show, the show, or is it? I, let me, uh, with caveats. Uh, okay. It's, it's like a comfortable loafer, putting on a comfortable loafer. Some of the mm-hmm. writing is so... Um, by the numbers and some of the jokes uh, are flat and forced but there's a certain charm to the cast of characters he surrounded himself with in this thing um frazier in this show has relocated back to boston uh, after a long run as a dr phil style tv host in chicago i don't know maybe under the uh, uh oprah umbrella anyway it's so many years later uh, that Frederick, Frazier's kid with B.B. Newworth's Lilith character, is now a hunky but bemused firefighter in Boston. And Frazier moves in with Freddie, uh, initially dubbed Frederick, creating a mirror of the dynamic between Fussy Frazier and his working class ex-cop father in the original version of the show. So, you know, they're kind of flipping the switch on this thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. Nicholas Lindhurst, by the way, uh, from the massive UK sitcom hit uh, Only Fools and Horses. uh, He's right there on the right. He plays Frazier's colleague at Harvard, where Frazier is now a professor of psychology um, because he has been recruited uh, by the dean of the psychology department to raise the celebrity profile, you know, of her department. So in any event... Uh, uh, Freddie has got a cute single mom actress. Will they or won't they neighbor across the hall? Mm -hmm. Uh, There's Frazier's nervous nephew, son of his brother Niles and Niles' uh, wife Daphne from the original show. And this kid is comfortable in his collegiate uh, academic pursuits, but socially inept like, like Niles. Uh, By the way, David Hyde Pierce and Jane Leaves, who played Niles and Daphne, have not 
been slated to appear on the show, and John Mahoney, uh, who played Martin Crane, Fraser and uh, Niles' father so well, is dead, R.I.P. But Newworth and Perry Gilpin, who was Roz, uh, Fraser's producer on the old show, are slated to guest star at some point. Frasier is, like I said, it's like comfort food. It's not yeah. great. It's not anywhere near the heights of the original series, and times have changed. So, um, you know, it's not going to be that good by comparison, but I do, I find it kind of comforting to watch. Isn't that crazy? Say, comfy old shoe. That's awesome. No, I can, I, I see how it would be that way because the characters are familiar. The humor is familiar. And so, and probably the settings and the scene familiar as well. Sure. They, they hang out at a bar, not cheers. I'm wondering why they haven't just gone to cheers. They do mm -hmm. hang out at a, at a bar with the firefighters and the, and the Harvard uh, uh, students and, uh, and professors yeah. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, one more quick note. Ghosts, the original UK version of the haunted sitcom, mm -hmm. is now in its fifth and purportedly final series on the BBC. Uh -huh. And take it from me, it's still funny as hell. A young woman inherits, uh, inherits a mansion from a relative she doesn't know. She finds out that it's haunted when she's hit in the head and she can actually see and interact with generations of ghosts that live there. Uh, the idea was adapted very closely for an American version that became a massive hit for CBS here in the States. And they had so much success with the American version that the network is actually going to start running the original as oh. well, beginning on November 16th. Wait, followed by reruns of the American version, uh, which yeah, I guess you could do like an A, B compare and contrast. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, it's going to the new um, the American version is going to have new episodes coming sometime okay. after the SAG after strike is finally settled in the meantime i i love the original uh british version a quick note we got a text from Lori, a, a chat from Lori. she says brie larson is shocking me with how good she is in lessons in chemistry on apple uh she said saving new episode for later along with fellow travelers excited Oh, oh yeah. good. I will check that out. We do have Brie Larson um, headlining uh, the big movie next week, The Marvels, which we will discuss um, oh. hopefully next Friday. But in the meantime, always a pleasure, Kim. Uh, you yeah, can check you me too. out. Check me out on uh, Twitter or X at Culture Blaster on threads and Instagram at Mike the Knife one, two, three. And absolutely on the Mark Thompson show every Friday. Absolutely. Mark will be back next Friday. But until then, thank you, Culture Blaster Michael Snyder. And I appreciate you coming in and you come and go on a rainbow. That's right. Thank Farewell. you, Michael Snyder. Bye. Farewell. Have a great weekend. You too. Michael Snyder, everybody, and Michael Shore, and Jim Avila, and John Daly, and Albert, thank you for being here, too. couple people to thank right now. One, dollar a day, Pinky, never disappointing, coming on in with a dollar super sticker. Gail Guthrie for a $10 super sticker on this Friday. You made my Friday afternoon. You are awesome. Thank you for supporting the show. And thank you all for spending this time with uh, with me and Albert and all the guests here on the Mark Thompson Show. Mark uh, will be absent Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So we will be uh, keeping everything rolling until he returns midweek. Have a really good weekend. I will see you on the After Party Live in mere moments. The link is in the chat. Thank you for being here and have a great afternoon. Bye, everybody. Have a good one.